Well, good morning, everybody. It's about that time to get going. Welcome to worship this morning at Kaiser Christian Church. Welcome to all of you joining us from home this morning post-daylight savings time. Hopefully you've got all of your microwave and oven clocks changed. I don't, so I'll have to know what I'm doing this afternoon, making sure it all works. Uh, such a joy to be together again this morning. With the imminence of spring upon us, uh, even though the sky outside doesn't look much like it, we know it's coming. Flowers are blooming. And we have, amidst all of the other rigors of life, we have cause for joy this morning. If anything, for our being together, being in the presence of God. Let us begin our time of worship this morning with music. Join me in the call to worship this morning. Our 
God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Let all God's people cry out in joy. God's steadfast love endures forever. Come, let us worship the Lord of our salvation. Will you pray with me? God of immeasurable grace, you meet us in our time of need and cause your face to shine upon us. You sent your Son into the world that we might be saved. You fashioned us into vessels of your love and light. Redeem us this day, O God, that we may be found worthy of the one who came to bring us life. Amen. come to the time of our worship together where we lift up our blessings and our concerns. I invite those who have a birthday this month to stand and be recognized as we share the joy and the blessing of your life amongst us. Yes, thank you for the reminder of those who were celebrating this morning. You can pick up your birthday rock on your way out if you choose. We come now to the time of deep communion with God, our Creator, where we come bearing all of the things that weigh us down and those things that lift us up in like fashion hand them over to God's waiting hand in prayer, in conversation, in listening. Like in any good relationship, the one we have with God especially, we cannot forget to listen, even as we pour our hearts out in prayer and thanksgiving and concern. We must remember.
remember to listen for God's faithful response. As we pray and lift up the joys of our lives, our children and grandchildren, our loved ones and friends, those little interactions throughout our weeks and months that reflect God's grace to each of us, the things that we worry about and cause us fear and anxiety and frustration, asking God to help us let go of those things, to hand them over, to release us from our burden as God promises to do. We do all of that together. Now, as we pray, join me in a time of releasing all of that to God's loving hand. Gracious God, God who created each of us, calls each of us calls all of us together we lift up our prayers our thanksgivings and our cares and concerns to you this morning in the context of worship of being surrounded by your holy spirit Filled and refilled, comforted, healed. We ask your healing touch upon those who we know are hurting. We lift up our thanksgiving and our joy for your experiences of grace in our lives. We ask that you continue to inspire all of us and each of us as we seek to live into our God-given identity as your people. Show us the way that we should go. For it is in and through the person of Jesus Christ, whom you sent to save us all, that we find our way, that we reflect upon as we seek you, to seek to be your light in the world. Hear us this morning as we pray in the way that your son Jesus taught us to pray saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Join me in extending a blessing on our young ones this morning. Holy God, we ask your blessing again this morning upon the children and young ones in our community. May you fill them with your spirit. May they always know and remember your unbreakable promise to all of us. That you are with us and for us, Emmanuel. That there is nothing that they can do to break that covenant that you have made with your people. Help us as their caregivers to reflect that great promise in our relationship with them so that they know that they are loved and cared for regardless, no matter what. Amen. So on continues our march through the season of Lent. We survived, fairly unscathed, the experience of daylight saving time, losing an hour of sleep to what anymore is simply long-standing tradition. Some of us coming through this better than others. We find ourselves this morning looking at early parts of the book of Ephesians, this letter of Paul to the Christians in the city of Ephesus. What in the totality of this book is really a summation of Protestant Christian belief, particularly the section that we look at today in chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, here, the core of our belief. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Hopefully you heard in the midst of that, that core of our Protestant Christian belief that we are saved through no work of our own, but only through the grace of God. very core of our being. In reading and studying for this week, I was reminded of a scene from a movie that particularly models this belief, this awareness that it is nothing that we do that earns us grace and salvation. And conversely, nothing that we do that can break that covenant with God that we've been talking about this season of Lent. It comes from 
the movie The Mission. Who who remembers this movie called The Mission? Anyone remember this? I remember first seeing this movie uh, in high school, I think. It's got Robert De Niro and Liam Neeson. I guess who the other main character's name was. It's powerful actors telling the story of Jesuit missionaries in South America in the early parts what I think I remember right the 19th century but there's a character named Rodrigo who is a played by De Niro is a a slave trader. He, he begins the movie as a man of, of violence and armor and weapons going into the interior and kidnapping people, bringing them out to the ships, earning his money in this way. And at some point early in the film, in a jealous fit of rage, With his brother, an altercation occurs. See, they were both in love with the same woman, and he ends up killing his brother over this. He has a moment of deep and abiding shame and regret, brokenness. Looking at how his life of violence has led him to this point of where he's so consumed with his own power that he killed his own brother to get what he wanted. And so he beseeches the, the Jesuit brotherhood in the city to just simply allow him to live out the rest of his days in shame and grief in one of their cells and to simply fade away and die. And the priest that he talks to, see, Rodrigo sees no possibility for redemption. He is still in the mindset of that everything that happens to him must happen by his own power and volition, by his own creation and doing. But the priest offers him a different way. He says, we are going deep into the mountains to build a mission with the people of this place one of the tribes deep in the Amazon. Come with us. The journey of penance. And Rodrigo takes him up on this offer, but he insists on hauling in a, in a mass, tied up in nets and dragged behind him. He admits, on, insists on hauling along the elements of his now previous life of his armor and his weapons, hundreds of pounds of metal, this unwieldy mass behind him. He hauls it along the trail, through the mountains, up stream beds, climbing a waterfall, all the while this weight hanging from his shoulders. And after this long, exhausting journey, they arrive at the village that they have come to serve, to bring good news. Now, Rodrigo fully expects being known to these people, having his past actions known, expects to come and die. Expects them to kill him for what he has done to their people. As the priests are welcomed by their friends and joy and expectation, they sit gathered and, and all of a sudden up the trail crawls Rodrigo with this weight behind him and he collapses on all fours 
some distance away, everyone drops silent. This unexpected arrival. One of the indigenous people takes a knife. It runs toward Rodrigo, grabs his head, and puts the knife to his neck. Rodrigo doesn't move, believing that he is going to get what he deserves. The priests are frozen, waiting to see what would happen with these people who they have worked with and spoken with, preached and lived with. The leader of the people calls out. The warrior with the knife shifts his hand, grabs the rope holding Rodrigo down, cuts it away. pushes that unwieldy weight of sin and shame off the mountain into the river. The rest of the scene comprised of Rodrigo weeping and crying and surprise and ultimately joy and confused acceptance of forgiveness, redemption, invitation to community. What he learns throughout the rest of the film is that nothing he did on that journey in any way earned that experience once he arrived, that grace and forgiveness that he experienced, not hauling those hundred pounds of of weapons and armor, that didn't impress the people who he had harmed so much, that didn't outweigh anything he had done in his life before, That was not why he was saved. Here in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, the overarching theme throughout the entire book is that of reconciliation with God and with each other. Most scholars even agree that its circulation was intended for a far wider audience than only the people and Christians in Ephesus. The focus in this letter is on we, not me. We look at verse 6 for confirmation of that, where it tells us, that God raised us up with him, seated us with him in the heavenly places. This letter is written to groups of people, not individuals. We all too often allow ourselves to read Scripture with a view to the individual. We read it and we ask, what does this mean for me? What does it mean to me? But it was never intended to be understood in this way. We need to be asking the question, what does this mean for us? Just as there is no thing that we can do to earn our salvation, 
the character of Rodrigo in the mission. Also, there is no thing that we can do to break this covenant that God has made with us. Made clear in verses 8 and 9. Again, we hear the writer say, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. And he couldn't be more clear. Not by your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. And we may say, what about verse 10? It talks about doing good works. But the order here is integral and specific to the message. What happens first? Salvation by grace. What happens next? Us remembering that we are created, called by God to do good works, as our, we said before, our gracious response. Because God acted first, made us, made covenant with us. Now looking again at verse 10 and how and why we were created. For we are what God has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our very way of life. The word used here for created work or, or that thing which God created us, the word here is the Greek word for poem of all things. That work that we are of God's poem. So we are literally the poetic act of God. You hear that? We are the poetic act of God, created for good works. We are works of art, created to do works of art. We are, we are a poem. Each of us, a line, a phrase, a stanza. Now I ask you, how do you break a poem? Can you do that? Can't break a poem. Especially not the individual parts of it. We have no power to break that which God has created covenant relationship with each of us. We are part of and participants of God's great work of art. Even with our God-given identity as artists and co-creators in God's artistic work, those with whom God has covenanted, saved through grace in Christ Jesus, even with all of this, we must remember that it, in this grand story of us, we aren't the main characters. Does that sound strange? We all kind of go through life assuming that we're the main character in our own story, right? Uh, just a human Thing to do. If you write a story about your life, you're the main character, right? But not the way God tells it. Even with all of this free will and agency that God grants us with the, the joy of our salvation, we're not the main characters in our own story. Sure, we act like we are, giving ourselves more credit and power than we are often do constantly veering away from a communal understanding of discipleship and what it means to be God's people, to individual freedoms and desires. But we forget that even with our God-given free will, none of us has the power to break covenant with God. 
because we didn't create that covenant. God is the main character in this story of us. God is the first mover who first loved us, created us, covenanted with us, sent Jesus Christ to save us. God does these things, has done, continues to do. And anything that we do is response to God who first moved, to God's first having us, loving us, saving us, teaching us grace. It is our own gracious response, not to earn salvation. Again, we come back to the, the very order that things happen in, especially in our scripture today. By grace we are saved, raised up with God, seated with God in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That happens first. The call for us to respond comes second. We do not earn our salvation, but we, in gracious response to salvation already given, engage in good works. God's covenant is unbreakable. Nothing we do can change that. Like Rodrigo in the mission, nothing he did removed him from God's love, nor earned him God's love. Now his actions certainly had repercussions and consequences. To be sure, he hurt many people and needed to take responsibility, but it was the love and grace of God that redeemed him, working in the hearts of other people. Just as the love and grace of God does for each of us, for all of us. The scripture here is pretty clear our own paths that we create for ourselves, our own human doings, the path of the individual, rationalizing true, or rationalizing our self-serving actions and desires leads to death. The path of God. Responding to God's love and grace and kind being used by God in embracing our created identity as the poetic action of God in the world and with one another, to responding with good work in the world as we are created to do. This path leads to life. The way of life God has always intended for us. Again, we read this passage today and sometimes subtitled From Death to Life. It starts with how we were dead. How God moved and brought us back to life. God has created, acted, covenanted with us a path from death to life. A life of reconciliation with God and one another. Created in Christ Jesus, as the scripture says, created for good works to be our way of life. Loving one another acts of self-sacrifice, giving, sharing, helping, spending our resources on others. And the list can go on and on, not even limited by our imagination, but by our listening deeply 
to the call from God to do good in the world. It is in our gracious response to God's salvation through grace that we feel most alive, isn't it? In the doing of these responsive good works that we thrive. Not because it earns us salvation, but because it is what we were created to do. Because it makes us truly alive. We are left with some questions. In this navigating the path from death to life, responding to God's call and invitation, awareness and remembrance of our God-given identity, people of God, created to do good works, we must ask ourselves, when are you most alive? In the midst of our faithful community as people of God, there is a call upon each of us. Those experiences where we have felt most alive, being used by God for good work. Then what? The second question for all of us. How can the church, the church in, in this place with these people, in the wider church in ever concentric circles and wider spheres of influence, how can the church in all its definitions provide ways for people to be fully alive? How can we do something? Not just me or I. How do we create that opportunity? How do we respond to the grace of God with gracious to one another? Let us follow the call from God to seek each of these answers together. Amen. Continue in worship this morning with our hymn of response. There's a wideness in God's mercy. Remember the children's song, This Little Light of Mine? If you could sing, I'd have you sing it. Every time we gather for worship, I can imagine each person as a little light, a candle.
starlight, a lantern in the dark forest, a flashlight in the night, all moving towards the light of life, Jesus. John's Gospel says it this way, those who do what is true come to the light. How are you letting your light shine? Are you on the move, heading closer to Jesus and his way of life as you travel? This time in our worship opens the door for you to let your light shine through your offering. When you share this, it's a sign of a little light which you of the little light which you are. Especially in these 40 days, may you be challenged and inspired to dig deep and offer a sacrificial gift to support this church and its ministry. When our lights are when our lights all come up together, what a glorious sight. Our deeds declare the love of God, that God made known in Jesus to Christ. Will you bow with me in prayer? Even as our lives reflect our love, Lord, we pray, multiply these gifts and extend our capacity that you will be known on the earth and your saving grace to all. Gently. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You remember this morning that God's covenant with all of us, with each of us, is something unbreakable. Promise from God to be with us, to be for us, to be in relationship with us, leading us always on the path of reconciliation with God's self and with one another. Remember that God's promise in this way extended even to sending part of God's self into the world in the person of Jesus Christ, God's only Son, to teach us that way, to continue to teach us. We come to this time of communion remembering the relationship we have with Christ our Savior. The invitation to all of us to be in communion, to come to this table of reconciliation each and every time that we gather. Again, the communal nature of the invitation is unmistakable. We do this together. We do not own this table. We do not dictate who comes or goes. We trust in God, reconciling with God and each other as we respond to the invitation to come. can't help it. The little ones will lead us. Nothing else I can say would make more of an impact. So we gather. We respond faithfully to the call of Christ to be together. To take these symbolic elements into our being just as we take Spirit of Christ into each of us, into all of us. We invite it to lead us, to show us the way, to do good works, not as a way of earning any place in heaven, because that has already been promised. Salvation has been given. We do this as faithful and gracious response. Let our time at this table be a time of cleansing, filling with that spirit that enables us to do those very good works. Will you pray with us?
thought as we gather around this table, we are mindful of the way that we continue to deny and betray Christ's presence in our lives. We proclaim, surely not our Lord, as we carry out our individual ministries, often with closed minds and hearts. Forgive us when we do not know and recognize the abiding presence of Christ in our lives. As we share this meal, the bread and the cup, may the presence be known and felt. May we go forth from this table with a renewed understanding of the ministry to which Christ is calling us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Just as we gather each time we worship around this table and ones like it, and remember Christ meeting with those early disciples, those ones he poured his life into, we remember that Jesus does and continues to do the same for all of us. Taking bread, blessing it and breaking it, giving it, saying, take and eat, this is my body broken for you. As often as you eat it, you remember me. And in like fashion, after the meal, Jesus took the cup, and after giving thanks, pours it out, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant, poured out for forgiveness of sin. As often as you drink it, you remember me. Let us join now together in Holy Communion. A couple of reminders as we pass through the halfway point of Lent that we are still planning on having uh, Holy Week services. We're doing, uh, we'll be having a Maundy Thursday service here in the sanctuary uh, for those that are interested in participating. Uh, we are also that Saturday uh, before Easter, uh, once again having our community Easter egg hunt. So uh, I hear a rumor that the Easter Bunny might even make an appearance this year again. So uh, working on uh, a plan for that. And we will be packing those Easter eggs after the service today. So those of you that are here that would like to participate in 
helping with that, we'll be gathering in the fellowship hall to pack all those Easter eggs for the participants of our Easter egg hunt. And they are still, uh, for those uh, in need or if, uh, to share this information far and wide, they are still providing uh, food boxes each Wednesday at St. Edward's Catholic Church from 10 to 12 in the parking lot. So if you or anyone you know uh, could make use of um, some kitchen staples and milk and cheese and eggs and different things, then please avail yourselves of that opportunity uh, every Wednesday at 10 to 12 at St. Edward's on River Road. Uh, I think uh, with that, let's all stand and recite our benediction together. Go, now is the time to worship. Go, now is the time to give your heart. Go, just as you are, to worship. Go, just as you are, before your God. People of God, go and do good works. <laughs>